Well, good morning to you. Good morning and merry 10th day of Christmas and a happy new year. We're doing it all this morning. <laughs> My name is Mike Farley. I'm the pastor of Spiritual Formation here, and it's a delight to welcome you to worship this morning. Those of you who are in person, and a welcome to those of you who are joining us online as well. We hope that you will follow along with us in the order of worship that you can find uh, on our live stream page there. Just a quick note that uh, many of our Bible studies and ministry groups will be resuming their meetings this week. Um, so if you would like to have any information about a group to join, uh, please contact me. I'll be happy to connect you with the whole array of options, and there'll be more information forthcoming on our, on our church's website as well uh, about ministry groups that you can join, where you can connect and belong uh, in, this, in this new year. Well, how do you face a new year with hope and confidence after the one we just went through? Uh, well, we do it with the confidence of Christmas. Christ the Lord has come to us in the flesh to go before us in walking the road that we are walking. No, no matter what your struggle is, no matter what you expect or fear in 2021, in Christ we have a hope. We have a deep down joy that's unconquered by any suffering because our Savior lives. And he is the one who calls us to worship this morning. So in light of that, I invite you to stand and respond to him and his call to us. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the second Adam and image of God, the true God become true man. Give glory to God in the highest through Jesus, who is Christ the Lord. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things in heaven and earth. Let's sing to our King.
Jesus the Christ has come. Christ has come indeed. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Our God, we come this morning celebrating the incarnation of God the Son, Jesus our Savior. We ask that you would strengthen us in hope and help us to worship you. Holy Spirit, give us soft hearts that the glorious truths we sing of, we hear, we pray today would accomplish your good and loving purposes in our hearts and lives. And all of this we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. I won't even ask you this morning about last year's resolutions. <laughs> Do you even remember what they were? Uh, I'm sure not. Uh, you know, there is something right, though, about this tradition of making resolutions because we really should long to change. But the change we need begins by confessing that we fail apart from God's wisdom and God's mercy and grace to us. It begins with laying ourselves before the Lord with the attitude that's expressed in these words. We know that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. So let us confess our sin and sorrow to him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the true temple of God, the holy God come near to dwell with us as man. But we often treat the gift of your presence as trivial and common. You have come to draw us near to enjoy a place of grace in your presence and walk in the light of your love. But we often turn from your love to walk in darkness. We have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. Take a moment to name your own sins before the Lord. Lord Jesus, please draw us near to the Father by your Spirit, that we might walk in the light of your love and in your presence find fullness of glory and joy forevermore. Amen. The Lord delights to answer that prayer we've just prayed. So with that confidence, I invite you to stand and hear the good news of the Christmas gospel, which is true for you even again this day. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. For all who've turned from sin in sorrow and look to God for mercy, this is his gift to you. In Jesus Christ, God loves you. God forgives you. God accepts you. And God rejoices over you as beloved daughters and sons. Hallelujah. Amen. And children, if you'd like to go to Children's Church, now's the time. You can head there, and the rest of us, let's sing to our Savior.
Please be seated. Well, good morning and Happy New Year to you. Welcome to Central Presbyterian Church, where we seek the transformation of our lives, our communities, and the world through the transforming work of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. My name is Charles Godwin. I am one of the pastors on staff here at Central for those who are worshiping both in person as well as those joining us online. I'm glad you're worshiping with us today. If you're a guest worshiping with us, I want to extend a special welcome to you and pray the Lord blesses you as you worship with us this morning. We continue to celebrate the incarnation of God the Son, Jesus our Savior, during this season of Christmas or Christmas Tide, which Mike referred to earlier as today is the 10th day of Christmas. Historically, the church has celebrated 12 days beginning on December 25. And so we are going to do that today by studying John chapter 1 and meditating on the glorious truth that Christ as God became man. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Written by Charles Wesley in 1739, these words that we sing during this season are a good backdrop for our text today. Our text is John 1, the first 14 verses. Let me pray for us and then we'll read the scriptures. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we do ask that you would give us soft hearts. Help us not to harden our hearts and help us to see Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. John 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Over the years and even in this season, we have read or listened to pieces of the Christmas story over and over again. And one thing that strikes me is the multiple times we see the word behold in the story. Whether it's the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Or when the angel comes to Mary, or when the angel comes to Joseph, or to the shepherds. When we see this word, it's meant to get our attention, right? Or at least it should. Behold, see. Look intently. And that's the purpose. In these stories, there is a sense that a lot of people actually are amazed or captivated by Christ and his coming. So that begs the question for us, what captivates you? What captivates me? Sadly, it's often not Christ and his coming, is it? What is it that commands your attention? What is it that you must have, and if you don't get it or have it, you are completely undone? Is it a person? 
Is it approval of a certain person or group? Is it success? Is it a certain look or body type? Is it a thing? Is it a particular situation or dream, a dream that if you don't realize it, you're incredibly unhappy and so is everyone else around you? The story of Jesus, God the Son, becoming man is a big deal in the scriptures and for our faith. It is captivating, or at least it should be. Philip Yancey writes, could it be true this Bethlehem story of a creator descending to be born on one small planet? If so, it is a story like no other. Little wonder a choir of angels broke out in spontaneous song, disturbing not only a few shepherds, but the entire universe. When our confession says the Bible teaches that Jesus continues to exist as both God and man with distinct natures forever, that is amazing. And it is something upon which we should spend some time meditating. So today, that's what we're going to do. We are going to dive into John's words and we are going to look at the reality that Christ as God coming into the world as a man. And because he has come, we receive grace upon grace. We see in our text this morning that Christ who comes into this world is God. John writes, he was with God and he was God. This translation of was in the beginning actually is the imperfect tense, meaning he was continuing in the beginning. Thus, there was never a time when Christ did not exist he didn't just come into existence when he was born as a man. No. We read in Colossians Paul's words about Jesus. Paul writes, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Christ is before all things. He created this world and us out of nothing. It makes me think of a scene from C.S. Lewis's The Magician's Nephew. He describes the beginning of the world. Lewis describes the lion Aslan as standing with his face to the sun, his coat being shining and radiant, and his mouth is open in song. And when he sings, grass begins to form around his feet, and then it spreads out. And then flowers and heather appear on the hillside, and they move about. Then he begins to sing a more lively song, and showers of birds fly out of the trees. Butterflies begin to flit about. And then comes great celebration as the song breaks out into an even wilder song. Christ gloriously created us and this world. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. We owe our very existence to him. Nothing happens in this world without his oversight. I read there are about 100, million, 100 billion stars in the average galaxy. And there are at least 100 million galaxies in known space. Einstein actually believed that we have scanned only one billionth of theoretical space. This means there are probably something like 10 octillion stars in the space. That's a 10 with 27 zeros behind it. And Jesus created them all. In him, all things hold together. Not only is he creator of the macrocosm of the universe, but he also is the creator of the microcosm of the tiniest Adam. And because he is God the creator, we can trust him. But he's also God the light. 
And as such, he is stronger than the darkness. Any darkness that we see or feel in our lives and in the world around us. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. A hymn we sing at this time of year, O Come All Ye Faithful, describes this for us. True God of true God, light from light eternal. Lo, he shuns not the virgin's womb. Son of the Father, begotten, not created. O come, let us adore him. When we think of this image of God as light in the scriptures, we may think of it as exposing our sin and brokenness, bringing it into the light where it can be healed. But there is also this image in the Bible that would have brought comfort to John's hearers and us that God is light is with them, never leaving them in their own brokenness and darkness, never leaving them as they live in a broken, dark world. Many kids, when they're young, many adults too, right, want a nightlight in their room or outside of their room. Why is that? Well, there is some level of comfort when darkness is dispelled by the light. Similarly, I heard a pastor refer to the pillar of fire that God gave the Israelites in the wilderness after leaving Egypt. It was a symbol to them that he was with them. In our text today, we see Jesus is God the light. Not just exposing our sin, but he is with us And he overcomes our sin and brokenness and the brokenness of our world. He has come to make all things new. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, Through all the advents of our life that we celebrate runs the longing for the last advent. When the world will be, see, I am making all things new. When we speak of Christ being God, it is important for us to understand that as such, he has all of the attributes of God. Our confession says he's infinite, he's eternal and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And this is important, the confession says, listen to this, so that Christ may sustain and keep us from sinking under God's wrath and the power of death, that he may give worth and efficacy to his sufferings, obedience, and intercession, and that he may satisfy God's justice, procure his favor, purchase a peculiar people, give his spirit to us, conquer all our enemies, and bring us to everlasting salvation. Christ is God. And it is important for us to review and rehearse this to dive into this truth today. But we also see in our text, Christ is also man. John writes, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. God becoming flesh. I was talking with someone a while back about how this is odd to us, at least in a couple of ways. One, there has only been one immaculate conception in history. And that's Jesus. That God became man. Immaculate conception. The wisdom of God truly is odd. It's foolish to man. But it's also odd in another way that I think Paul accurately conveys in Romans 5. Where he writes this. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to die. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. 
For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is not something for us just to sort of skip lightly over the surface of or take lightly. It's something for us to truly dwell upon. Our God, full of grace and truth, loves us like no other. He delights in mercy. We like sheep turn astray, each of us to our own way, and God lays on Jesus our sins. We reject him, yet he is still extending love today. John writes, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then just a few verses down, we didn't read this in verse 16. John writes, for from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. About this, Martin Luther wrote, he said, The sun's not dimmed or darkened by shining on so many people or by providing the entire world with light and splendor. It retains its light intact. It loses nothing. It is immeasurable, perhaps able to illumine ten more worlds. I suppose that a hundred thousand candles could be ignited from one light and still this light would not lose any brilliance. Thus Christ our Lord to whom we must flee and to whom we must ask all is an interminable well, the chief source of all grace. Even if the whole world, Luther writes, were to draw from this fountain enough grace and truth to transform all people into angels, still it would not lose as much a drop. This fountain constantly overflows with sheer grace. When we ponder Christ being a man, just like we did with God, and considering that he has all of God's attributes, it's important for us to understand he has all of the attributes of man, body, emotions, except our sin. But he certainly feels it. He certainly experiences it. He experienced the same things we did. We do. He lived in a house. He had parents. He had to work. He exercised. He ate food. He identifies with us intimately. He had feelings. He understands the brokenness in our world. He was deeply affected by sin and brokenness to the point that he took it on himself on the cross. And he bore the penalty our sins deserve, which the Bible says is death, so that by his wounds we are healed. Instead of death, we receive forgiveness full and free. We receive redemption at work in us and in our broken world. We receive adoption as children. We receive access to the throne of grace. In this text, we see Christ as man. Not only do we see our reconciliation with God, but in him we also have a picture of what can be and what will be when Christ finally comes again. A glorious, redeemed, whole man and whole world. In Christ, we are becoming new. And it's not just us, but it's our broken world. In him we see what a whole human being without sin really can be. Our reconciliation with God in Christ means the curse will be reversed in us and in this world. What a captivating truth and certainly something for us to behold. So what does this mean for us? First, John gives us some direction in verse 12. He says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Receive him. Receive him. Believe in his name 
today. We in this world are under the curse of sin and brokenness and darkness, and Jesus is the light of the world still today for hostile, dark hearts, sinful hearts, and a dark world. This is amazing love. The Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive him and you will be saved. Where meek souls will receive him still. What did we just sing? The dear Christ enters in. Receive him today. Another thing for us to consider is that Jesus is the light of the world. And he's not just light for ye. The same Jesus who says, I am the light of the world, in his Sermon on the Mount, says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. As those who have received grace upon grace, we impart grace to a broken, dark world around us. We're not saved by being light. We are saved because he has shown his light to us and in us. I heard someone once say, knowing this, we become his light reflectors. We are privileged to be moons or mirrors that reflect light to people in life near and far that he is the light of the world. To follow him is not to walk in darkness, but to have the light of life. Thirdly, as you reflect upon Christ being your creator, know this, he knows just what you need. Think about where you're struggling to trust him today and remind your soul that he knows your needs he's no stranger to your weaknesses he's your creator and ask him to help you trust him i shared this with you before but i think it's worth sharing again it's about a man named charles steinmetz he was the mechanical genius behind the ford in the early days It was said he could build this motor in its mind, and if he broke it, he could fix it in his mind. One day, the assembly line at the Ford Motor Company broke down. None of Ford's men could fix it, so they called his friend, Charles Steinmetz. He tinkered just a few minutes, threw the switch, and it started running a few days, again, running again. But a few days later, Ford received a bill from Steinmetz for $10,000. Ford wrote back, Charlie, don't you think your bill is a little high for just a little tinkering? Steinmetz sent back a revised bill, tinkering $10, knowing where to tinker, (laughs) $9,990. Friends, Christ, your creator, your creator, knows just what you need. Sometimes we forget that in a year like this past year, right? Sometimes we forget that in the midst of our own sin and brokenness and the brokenness of our world. Paul David Tripp in his Advent Reader wonderfully reminds us, you see, the real historical events of the incarnation of Jesus are our guarantee that God will continue to deliver to us everything we need. We need divine rescue, he writes. We need forgiveness. We need to be transformed and we need to be delivered. We need mercy. We need his rule and we need his love. None of these things are at stake. None of these things will wear out. None of these things will just quit working. God will never get tired of blessing us with these things. God will never get impatient and decide to quit. He will never get so irritated with the things we say and do that he will turn his back on us and walk away. He will not get distracted or become weary. Lastly, the same John that wrote these words that we've read this morning over and over, but to all who did receive him, 
who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He also wrote this, Behold, what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Friends, this is an amazing love story. This is an amazing love story in love. Jesus became flesh so that you and I can become children of God. Even though we reject him, we rebel against him, we are his enemies. Christ the light came, lived a perfect life, and died for sinful, broken people like you and me who walk in darkness and for a sinful, broken, dark world. But friends, he's not in the grave anymore. He is risen Death could not hold him captive. He rose from the grave, the most significant, visible expression of power the world has ever seen. It's the resurrection. He now sits in heaven, and he will come again. And when he does, death, sin, brokenness, darkness will be no more. No political or military ruler could do that for us. No amount of wealth could purchase or earn that for us. Only Jesus could do this. The Son of God, born of Mary, who humbled himself by coming to earth from heaven. He lived in this broken and sinful world without sin. He died a sinner's death so that you and me in this world, we may have life. God and sinners are reconciled by the love of God in Christ that is full of power. Power that, as one scholar wrote, makes dry wombs conceive, removes hearts of stone, and replaces them with hearts of flesh, and raises the dead. Take time to wonder at this truth. Not just during Advent and Christmas tide, but every day. Kent Hughes writes, our spiritual growth is inextricably bound up with the size of our vision of Jesus. So take time to gaze upon Jesus, as the hymn says, to turn your eyes upon him. To find Christ bigger and his love more wonderful and amazing. One pastor marvels, and I'll end with this. The Christmas story is the world's best love story. It's about a God of love sending the son of his love to live a life of love and die a death of love so that all who believe in him would be welcomed into the arms of his love forever and ever. Embedded in the Christmas story is a promise of unbroken love for the children of God. You can do the dumbest thing. And God will still love you, he writes. You can have a day when you ignore his existence and God will still love you. You can fail to do what he's called you to do and he will still love you. He goes on to say, I'm not arguing that sin is okay or that you should not take it seriously. I'm arguing that the security of our relationship with God has never depended on the faithfulness of our obedience. If God withdrew his love every time we failed, there would be no hope for any of us. The unbreakable faithfulness of God's love for us is such a huge comfort precisely because we are unfaithful. The unstained perfection of God's love gives us such hope because we aren't perfect. Christ as God has come into the world as man, and because he has come, we receive grace upon grace in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God and that word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth let's pray together God we prayed at the beginning of this time that you, by your Spirit, would give us soft hearts that we would see Jesus. And so we pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would accomplish your loving purposes in our hearts and lives through the Word. Through the Word that became flesh 
and dwelt among us. Help us to see Jesus as we continue to worship now. And we pray in his name. Amen. Well, how does the Lord want you to walk in his light and his love in a new way even this week? The offering is a time every week in our liturgy when we have an opportunity to begin to to form a renewed desire, a renewed intention uh, to follow Christ in light of his word to us. Um, While we won't receive a physical offering this morning, there are many opportunities to give, and you can find the page labeled Giving on our church's website and use one of the uh, options that are there. But I invite you to take a few moments in quiet and begin to ask the Lord, how is he calling you to respond, uh, to walk in the light of his, uh, in the power of his creation, power of his new creation uh, to us? Um, We will sing, we have a new hymn for us uh, today. It's a glorious hymn that tells, in a sense, the whole story that we've just heard of the grace and life of our Lord. Um, So uh, listen and uh, join in as you you catch on.
In the light of that hope, let's turn to our Lord and ask for his grace uh, to follow him as he's called us. Let's pray. Our eternal King, your steadfast love is new every morning and in every new year. Indeed, your steadfast love for us endures forever and ever. You have drawn so near to us in Jesus, the word who took on our flesh, our nature, our weakness and suffering upon himself in love. So we are bold to ask this morning that you would draw near, us near to you and help us to put on the character of Christ, to grow more and more into your image and likeness. Please help us put on kindness and compassion. Give us compassion for others and humility to think less of ourselves and more of ways we can serve one another. Please guide our, our deacons, our shepherds, and, and all of us to serve people in need. Widows, the unemployed, hurting people who need help with counseling and mentoring, people who have practical needs, whether fixing homes or learning new skills or just someone to listen well and talk. Lord, please help us become more and more a church that moves toward suffering and need with the deep energy of your boundless compassion. We thank you especially today for people in healthcare and government who are working so hard to distribute vaccines and help us bring this pandemic to an end. Lord, give them protection and wisdom and undaunted strength to persevere in doing good. Lord, please help us put on peace we pray that your peace would rule in our hearts, in our homes, and wherever you lead us. Please draw friends and neighbors together, heal broken marriages, reconcile parents and children, and give us strength to live at peace with everyone as far as it depends on us. We especially ask that you would lead us as a church in this year to learn how we can best use the gifts you've given us to serve the needs of our city and to pursue its peace across boundaries and obstacles of distance and economics and race and history. Lord, please help us put on forgiveness. Help us forgive as we have been forgiven abundantly by you and to love as we have been loved abundantly by you. By your powerful grace, we pray that you would reconcile and heal relationships that are strained or distant and full of tension and conflict. We know that you are Christ the Lord a light for all who walk in darkness and despair, a light no darkness can overcome. So we pray that you would give us hope for change and for love to prevail where there seems to be no hope. Lord, please help your word to dwell in us richly in this new year so that our lives overflow with thanks and with wisdom and with hope. Please fill us with an unconquered joy and hope that bear us up and sustain with us with supernatural strength we pray for opportunities to share joy and hope with others. Please make us eager to share the reasons for the hope that we have with gentleness and respect. Lord, we ask that your life and light would be reflected in us and through us into the lives of other people who need to know you and who long for the life and hope that only you can give them. Lord, we know that we cannot accomplish any of this, but only of you can bring about all these blessings of your kingdom in our lives. And only your kingdom can bring true, true peace to our broken world. So we pray for the coming of your kingdom in all its fullness in the words that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we close this morning, I want to remind you, if you have a prayer request for which you want us to pray, please email those to us at prayer at centralprez.com. If you have a care need um, as you enter into this new year, please email those to us at care at centralprez.com. And now, beloved friends and people of God, please stretch forth your hands and receive this good word as God sends us out. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to our only wise God be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord and all of God's people said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.